The word of the Lord says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. How many of you knew what events were going to occur one year ago before they happen. How many of you knew that you might lose a job or that your health would go down or that you would lose a loved one? Anybody? Most of us don't know what a new year is going to bring, do we? True story, I called my brother um, Christmas Day to wish him happy, or Merry Christmas, excuse me. And I could tell he was down a little bit, and as I got to talking to him, he said, my, I have a real good friend that died this morning. And I said, what happened? Well, there's a couple that is good friends of ours, and um, I, I, I'm their baseball coach for their, their 12-year-old boy. And um, I was in church here a while back, and my, uh, uh, the boy's mom, my friend, uh, looked like she was down. And so I asked her, what's the problem? And she looked at me and she said, I just got diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer. He said, what? You don't smoke. She said, I used to. And so she underwent uh, chemotherapy and had part of her lung removed and it looked like they had everything contained and they'd given her a year and a half to live. Oh, they had it contained but not stopped. She went back for a three month checkup just before Christmas, while they were putting decorations up at church and getting ready for festivities, and they told her that her cancer had moved to her brain. So as the church was working and putting up decorations and they had all the people up there hustle and bustle, my brother went up there uh, to help out and he, he said he saw her up there. She was wearing something over her face because of germs because she's under... Uh, such strong chemotherapy and, and um, uh, she had a rag around her head and she was up there working as hard as she could. And my brother knew that she was weak and he went up there and asked her, what are you doing here? And she said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm helping everybody else. He said, but shouldn't you be at home resting? And she said these words. She said, I'm going to try to do as much as I can while I still can. Now I want you to think about those words for just a minute. I don't know what it must have been for like that 12 year old boy when he got up Christmas morning to find out that his mother had died at 6.30 that morning. And it must have been a crushing blow but I want you to think about the words that she said I'm going to do as much as I can while I still can. While there's still time I'm going to serve. And I wonder if all of us would think about not knowing what the future holds if we could put that same 
philosophy at least into practice. You see, because I think a lot of times, a lot of us go about our lives and we pursue things that we think are very important. But if you knew today that you only had a year and a half left to live, what would change? What are some things that you would think about that you'd need to do? Let's shrink that time down. Let's just say a year. Let's just say you only had one year left to live and you knew you only had one year left to live. Would you do anything differently? And if so, what are the things that would become important? Narrow it down to a month. Let's go ahead and do a week. You've got one week left to live. If you're like me and you're processing this right now, some of the things that you thought were important would go out the window. You wouldn't pursue those anymore. But some of the things that were on the back burner that you just thought were good things would all of a sudden become very important. I want you to think as we approach this new year, and I hope that you'll glean from this passage, from the Apostle Paul, just two things this morning that, that are paramount items that every one of us could put into practice right now if you have the spirit of the living God living in you. Without Jesus, we're nothing. You can't do what I'm telling you without Jesus. But with Jesus, we can do all things. Amen? And the first, you can find it in verse 2 here. He begins with verse 1. I thought this was funny. It's, this is biblical proof that the Apostle Paul is a Baptist preacher. He says, finally, my brothers, and then he preaches on, it seems like, for a long time. That was funny. But in verse 2, he says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What he's saying is, is that what we need to do is perform a godly separation. A godly separation. He's saying that you need to separate yourself from sinful people. Now let me qualify that statement. I am not saying that we should as a church form walls around this church and have a little glee club where it's just all us holier than thou's here and have nothing to do with the world around us. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying. That is not what I'm trying to communicate as well. What I mean by separate is don't be put in a situation where you might be mistaken as one of them. Live your life in such a way as to bring glory to Jesus Christ and not be confused with the world. You see, Jesus associated with sinful people, and I'm standing here in front of you today as one lost that was lost in sin, and Jesus loved him anyway, and I praise God that Jesus hangs out with sinful people. But as much as Jesus hung out with sinful people, he never became like them in order to reach them. I find it amazing today that especially in uh, younger places that there are, are, are people that will go and they will, you, are, you've seen all the piercing? You know what I'm talking about. It looks like a tackle box exploded in their face. <laughs> Some people will do that in order to reach people that are into piercing. And I'm like, well, you don't dress up like a clown and go to a circus to win, win people at the circus, or do you? You see, what I'm saying is, and listen, I'm not ragging people that have piercings, okay? If you heard that, you heard the wrong message. What I am saying is, you do not have to become like the world in order to reach the world. There's a separateness that we are called to. And he says, he, what he's saying is, watch out, beware. Uh, don't be influenced by the world. It's not who we're supposed to be. It's not what we're supposed to be about. On the contrary, we should be influencing the world. Here Paul gives us, he gives us three classes of sinful people. This is really cool. He starts off with dogs. Do you think he really means dogs? I mean like dogs. Like my little dog Charlie. You think that's what he means? Beware of the dogs? No. Well, it's an interesting thing. When you read through the scriptures, at least in the, in the Hebrew mindset, a Jew's mindset, a dog is something that's godless. Jesus referred to Gentiles as dogs. And there was a Gentile woman one day that told Jesus, said, well, even the dogs get to eat crumbs off her. She referred to herself 
as a dog. Why? Because they are godless, void of any godliness in their life. They have not been saved. They, they don't worship God. There are people that have no thought of God in their thought process, and that just means that they are godless. Does God love them? He loves all those that he's saving. And by the way, there's a lot of us in here can say that we were in the neighborhood of dogs in our life. Am I right? And so he's talking about the godless ones, but the second class is the ones that are called evildoers. Youth, are you zoning in with me here today? Because I, I really want to get your attention as much as I can. You know what an evildoer is? It's not somebody that's just godless, but it's somebody that actually devises and plans and schemes on doing evil things all the time. They, they're, they're always looking to do something that's wrong. They're always looking to break a rule or start trouble or stir up hatred. Some of you might know that in the city that we live in right now that they're, they're saying that the gang violence is getting worse and worse. And in order to be a member of the gang, sometimes you are initiated. And that initiate, initiation is a process of going and doing something that is evil. And you might say, you know what, that, that's really wrong and boy, I'm not one of them. This is a sucker punch, I know. But did you know that being a gossip is just as bad as becoming a gangbanger? Have you thought about that? Because when somebody gossips, they're actually trying to say something to hurt somebody else or to demean somebody else. Even if what they're saying is true, they're only saying it so that the other person will be looked down upon. It's people who love strife in their life. He's saying beware of those people too. But it's almost like He's building up a case. It's easy for you and me to say, man, don't be like a dog, a godless person. And by the way, don't be like an evildoer. See, he's escalating things a little bit. And then he brings out the worst bunch of the whole thing. Look again. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil, evildoers. And then he says, look out for those who do what? Mutilate the flesh. In other words, look out for the religious legalists. They're the most dangerous and insipid kind of sinner that you can find. You see, religion and religious people were a major problem in the Philippian church and in the, the city of Philippi. Paul had to deal with this problem, and it's called legalism. It's when you take something and you make it a law and you add that to the gospel. Here's what's taking place. There are some people, they're called Judaizers. And they said they believe in Jesus Christ. But then they said, but believing in Jesus is not enough. Je just believing in Jesus is not enough in and of itself. You have to take Jesus and you have to add the circumcision to it. And not only do you have to add circumcision, but you've got to keep the law too. So it's Jesus plus circumcision plus the law, and that's going to get you into heaven. I'm here today to tell you that the Bible says, the Bible says that you do not need anything but Jesus in order to be saved. It's Jesus plus nothing. And you say, well, we don't do that. We don't have that in our day and age. Well, I beg to differ. Some that are, have the banner of evangelicals will say, well, you must believe in Jesus and you must be baptized in order to be saved. Or you must believe in Jesus and be baptized and dress a certain way in order to get into heaven. Or you must believe in Jesus. See, this is endless. You must believe in Jesus, be baptized, dress a certain way, and speak in an unknown language or something like that in order for you to be saved. And all of that is just the same. You must believe in Jesus and him alone in order to be saved. Am I saying that a person that's saved ought not get baptized? Heaven forbid, no. A person that is saved will practice obedience in baptism. But the water is just poured out through water. It doesn't save you. But it is a sign that you've been saved. And so what God's word is teaching us in this is to be in the world, but not to be of the world. To live your life in such a way that your testimony will never be confused with dogs, with evildoers, and religious legalists. Here's a practical application for you. 
who can I pick on? I, I just love picking on youth because I love youth. I'm telling you, somebody said the youth is a church for tomorrow. No, they're church now. If they're born again, they're church now. And I like youth because if you don't tell them they can't do something, they'll get it done. But I want you to just think about it for just a minute. If you go and you hang out with troublemakers and you dress the way the troublemakers dress and, and you act the way the troublemakers act, then you're confusing people as to who you are and you're confusing people as to whose you are. You see, you belong to Jesus. He bought you with a price. And so you are his property. You might go and witness to somebody that may be in a gang, but you can never yourself become a gang member. Do you see how this works? Let me pick on girls for just a little bit. You might say, I want to witness to a floozy. Do you know what a floozy is? They're looking at me like I'm speaking Greek. Have you ever heard the word floozy? It's somebody that paints themselves up like Jezebel, my grandmother used to say. You know who Jezebel is? Let's don't even go there. You paint yourself up like a prostitute that hangs out on the street. Wear a dress so short that it, doesn't, that it reveals everything that you have seemingly below your waistline and wear your top so low that it reveals everything that's above the waistline. I don't know what's coming next. I guess it's just going to be waistbands for girls will be the new style. But there's some people that say, well, if I'm going to hang out in this crowd, I've got to dress like a floozy in order to do that. No, you're the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to dress like a floozy in order to reach a floozy. So look at your neighbor right now and say, don't be a floozy. He tells us that we ought to separate from sinful people, but don't miss this. We ought to separate from our selfish pride as well. Look at verse 7, or verse 4. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, I can brag, he said. I've got a better reason to brag about who I am than anybody. He says, I've been on verse 5, I've been circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law. This is boastful, isn't it? Blameless. He says, I have bragging rights because I've been circumcised. In other words, I've been raised by godly parents. They were concerned about my godly upbringing. Of the people of Israel, in other words, God's chosen people, God's chosen race. I, I was born into that, and not only that, more specifically of the tribe of Benjamin. It's a family that is famous for serving God. And so that's who I am relationally. That's my bloodline. And then he says, I'm also a Hebrew of Hebrews. I personally practice who I am. My understanding uh, in the law, uh, I I, I'm so upstanding in the law that I, that I am keeping it up so much that I have become a Pharisee. I have climbed the proverbial token pole in the church. I became a somebody. Well, listen to me today. The point that he's making is, he says, I've counted it all as rubbish. The point is this, just because you're a pastor or a church member, or a Sunday school teacher, or a deacon, doesn't mean a thing when you compare it to Jesus. The best we can do is present all our righteousness as filthy rags to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it also means this, just because your grandma drug you to church all the time doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Just because mama and daddy prayed over you and taught you right and asked you to go into the house of God and begged you and prayed for you doesn't mean that you're born again. It doesn't mean that your soul is going to heaven when you die. You cannot ride your mama's skirt tail into heaven. There will be a lot of people that will say in that last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't I have the perfect Sunday school attendance record? Didn't I, didn't I testify as to your greatness? And the Lord's going to look at him and say, why don't you depart from me, you worker of iniquity? I never, ever knew you. 
You see, when we start thinking we're something, when we're really nothing apart from Jesus Christ, then we're setting ourselves up for a fall. Amen? So he says, perform a godly separation from all of that stuff. Recognize it and stay away from that. But the second thing that he says, lastly this morning, is pursue the glorious Savior. It's one thing for us to say we're putting away our sin and we're repenting on it, of it. But repentance is not complete until it pursues something else, till it turns the other direction and runs completely the other way. Pursue the glorious Savior. Look at verse 7. He says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul said it right. Everything that I once thought was important, my life's pursuit, of perfection, of holiness, and a life that would be well-pleasing to God. Everything that I once thought was good, I am now, I consider it to be rubbish. Can I give you the better translation of that word? Dung. Can I translate that word for you? You're looking at me. Poo-poo. Let me ask you something. This is disgusting. Have you ever stepped in dung when you step in it do you just take your hand and wipe it off why not it's dung that's why not right he's saying the best I could ever come up with is poo poo in the eyes of the Lord. Compared to the surpassing, just knowing Jesus Christ, everything else, all my religious legalism, all my heritage, everything about, uh, about my life is, is, is nothing compared to just knowing Jesus Christ and being with him. He is everything to me and everything else pales in comparison to him. It not only pales, it is rubbish, it is dung, when I see the surpassing glory of Jesus. Why? Because there's nothing better than Jesus. Paul said it best in Colossians 3.11. He said these words, Christ is all. He's all. He's everything. He's not just something that's great. He's everything. Nothing else compares to him. Christ is all, if you think about it, in regards to our righteousness. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. We are desperately sinful people. Our righteousness before God is presented in the righteous Jesus Christ standing before him in our place. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 says he, he is made to us righteousness. It also says that he is all in regards to our sanctification. He has made to us our sanctification, the scripture says. In other words, he is our sanctification, not us. Christ is all in, in regards to acceptance with God. Think about this. Ephesians chapter 1 says he has made us favorites, as some versions render it. You see, a wicked man who is outside of Christ is outside of the favor of God. Those whom God has chosen, he has placed the mark of being the favored ones. God will not hear the prayers of those that are outside the favor of God. All he will hear is their sins. But now in Christ, in Christ, those who are in Christ and in Christ alone, God accepts them as his beloved. Christ is, is all in regard of assistance. Oh yes, listen to me. A Christian strength lies in Christ. The scripture says I can do all things through him who gives me strength. He is our divine assistance. Without him, the scripture says, we can do what? 
absolutely nothing of any significance. Christ is, is, is all in regard to our peace with God. Jesus said himself, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I'm the totality of it all. No man can come to the Father except by me, he says. So in Christ, we find our, our peace with God and in him alone. I'll say this and I'll shout it from the mountaintop. Muhammad never bought me peace with God. Buddha never bought me peace with God. Joseph Smith didn't buy me peace with God. Mary did not buy me peace with God. Only Jesus has bought me peace with God. He is all and in him is everything and in everything in him consists. And all God's people said, Amen. you see the truth is he who lacks Christ lacks justification. He who lacks Christ lacks the beauty of holiness. The person that lacks Christ has, has no true nobility. It's through Christ that we're related to God and we have the royal blood of heaven. Not through the church, not through anything else. <coughs> Please, excuse me. He who lacks Christ has no freedom. Oh, you say, well, he's free to sin. I'll tell you that he's in bondage to sin. But if the Son, Jesus Christ, sets you free, you will be free indeed. He who lacks Christ has no, no ability to even serve God. Jesus said himself, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. He who lacks Christ has no consolation. He has no comfort inside his soul because a soul without Christ has no biblical comfort and will rest gloriously. No, that's not the right word. Will rest eternally in a devil's hell without comfort. He who lacks Christ has no salvation. So I close with this this morning. Two things that are very obvious in this text. One is, turn away from evil. Repent. And pursue the glorious Savior, but do it with a passion. Do it with a passion. Can you imagine having a football team and having a bunch of players out there that really enjoyed sitting on the bench more than they liked being out there playing football. Do you think you would get anywhere? No, your team would be like, I'm not gonna make any NFL comparisons. Pursue with passion, look what he says in verse eight. I count everything as lost because, just because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them in rubbish in order that I may gain what? Gain Christ. And being found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Look at, look at the result. He gives the purpose of the whole thing in verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I believe this, and I guess the older I get, the more I believe it, is that those whom Jesus is calling to himself, those whom he is saving, he's saving to the uttermost. And it's those that fall in love with him and him alone Oh, I love our church, don't you? Amen. And I can fall in love with Christians, but those who fall in love with him and him alone will pursue him with a holy passion because once they taste and see the surpassing glory of him, they will see that he is the treasure that we've all dreamed of ever wanting. He is beyond anything that this earth could compare. And with that, we see that everything else becomes rubbish and done. Now my question for you today is, is that you? The clock is ticking. Every one of us have a clock. Jesus says he's appointed under man, wants to die. And after that, there's a judgment. So I don't know when the day or the hour is, but I think I want to be like that woman that was up at church working, saying I want to make the best of my time 
while I still have time. And I want to pursue him with all that I can. If that's your prayer today, I rejoice with you. Maybe today you're saying, you know, I've never looked at Jesus in that light. I've always looked at Christianity as being wrapped up in the church. Today, would you, would you look at the scripture? Just look at it. Read it plainly and see that a church can never save you. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that a church will save you or a person. Only Jesus. And would you look to the Savior today and say, I'm gonna va- I, w- I value you more than life itself. I value you more than everything that I once thought was valuable. In fact, all those things now seem like garbage to me compared to you. I believe if you do that, and, and, and that's a, a heart thing, that if God's doing in you, he's revealing himself to you, then I believe that you're being welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. And today I'd ask you to respond to that. Say, you know, that's the life. I know. That's my Savior. I want to follow Him. And today during this invitation, I'm asking you to come. There's some of you uh, that are here that have been sitting in the shadows on the bench this next year. Would you say, I want to renew a passion for Jesus All this stuff that I'm pursuing may be well and good, but I really want to put Jesus first this year. And would you you make a commitment to him today? Come and bow on bended knee um, here before this altar or even in the chairs where you're at, and you just do some one-on-one with Jesus. And you make that that, uh, New Year's revolution to him. Some of you are in here today and you're saying, you know, I've been looking for a place to call home place to call uh, my church home and we're asking you today if if the Lord has impressed upon you that this is the place then we're asking you to come if it's not of the Lord we're asking you not to come we're asking you to go to where God wants you it's the best and safest place you could be but if this is the place we'd ask you to come during this time during this invitation say I'd like to be uh, a member of this family and worship God here now God's children said Amen.